awake in the middle of the night for quite a while, uh, stewing about building projects. <laughs> happens to me sometimes. Uh, it just kind of happens. And uh, I just want to kind of let you know what's going on with our, with our project and our hearing. And I shared uh, a few weeks back that uh, we've, kinda, we've come a long way. We've turned a lot of things in. We've done everything we've been asked to do. And uh, at the very end of the process, we got stuck with this, uh, I don't even know how to word this correctly, so I'll, I won't try to. Anyway, we're stuck uh, with what's called a wetland buffer or a critical areas improvement is the, the fancy way to say it. That um, Because of some different uh, federal codes and things that have changed since we originally purchased the property, um, the wetland setbacks and all that have encroach further onto the property than when we originally bought it, I guess we could say, just because of the rules. And, uh, and so we got to the end of this process with the city, and, and they said, hold on, um, you don't meet the standard, and, and we said, we know. Um, we've, we've been talking about that for a lot of years. And so they said, well, you have to apply for this variance and, and have a hearing and all that. And so we had a hearing um, scheduled for uh, this Wednesday. Uh, to go before hearing examiner and work through the process of getting that approved. Um, and, and the hope is that we could go into this. Now, there's, there's some things that were out of our control uh, with this hearing. One, I'm going to be doing a wedding in Arizona on Wednesday, so I can't be in two places at once. That's okay, other people can represent us. Uh, unfortunately, our wetland biologist is out of town also. And we thought, oh, that's okay, we'll be all right. Uh, but then this week we received the staff report from the city of Oregon and um, it was pretty scathing, and they are recommending to the examiner to not approve our project. And so uh, we made the decision uh, just at the end of the week that we're going to reschedule the hearing so that we can load up a little bit more. We need our biologist there. Um, we, need the, we need the professional there who can explain why, um, why they're wrong and why this is going to work. And since he wasn't able to be there, we felt... Uh, that it would be wise, you know, when you when you go through a decision, when you're denied, then you go through an appeal. If you ever watch football, you know, they usually go with the call on the field, right? Unless it's overturned with instant replay, kind of like that. So we didn't want to have to go through this process of, of now trying to overturn something because we didn't have the right representation there. So we'll have a new date coming out. We still need your prayers on this process, and this process has been very trying. Um, but this is, this is where we're at. And so uh, my, my hope was today to come to you and say, hey, well, I need you to show up and pray on Wednesday. But uh, we're going to be postponing that. So I will get you a new date soon. And uh, we will pray that everything works out. So in the meantime, uh, that's just where it's at. Um, you are all welcome to, and I've said this before, as a citizen of the city, you're welcome to show up at city council meetings. You're welcome to stand up and uh, share your thoughts. You're welcome to do that. I've done that once a couple months ago. So uh, that is within your rights to do. You're allowed to show up to the hearing. You're allowed to write the city. You're allowed to do all those kind of things. And so wherever that hits you, uh, just want to let you know that's where we're at. And so uh, I, I, I'm actually not super discouraged, maybe a little frustrated, but I'm not super discouraged because I know that uh, God's got a plan in all this. Amen. And so uh, that's where we're at. And as I was, as I was, so I was up in the middle of the night thinking about that, right? It's doing about that. But, but also I was thinking about um, the fact that I'm not alone in the process. When you ever go through difficult things or challenging things or things that maybe you aren't the expert in, isn't it nice to not be alone? And I was thinking about a, a couple of men uh, who have been advocates with me and for me, and I think they're both here, Jim Burbridge right here. We've been, we've been walking through this process for 10 plus years. And over the years, uh, I would just get to a place where I was like, hey man, the engineer is trying to charge us for something and I don't think this is legit. And he would say, let me make the call, right? He would advocate on my behalf. And it, places where we would get stuck or places where we're trying to work this out with the architect, he'd say, let me set up the meeting. And he would advocate. In the last year or so, um, another man, Chuck Sunsmo. Chuck's back here as well. I appreciate Chuck. These two men have both been advocates for this project and for me personally as we walk through this and we get stuck with places in the city and, and, and I want to lose my Christian witness and Chuck says, let me make the phone call, right? 
And so I get to stay a pastor, right? And he gets to make the phone call, right? And so uh, he's been talking with the city and he's been kind of uh, at the forefront of working out this hearing and talking with the city planner. And I, I just appreciate these two men. Um, and, and if you, you know, you can tell them thank you for what they've done after service. But I just, what I'm, I appreciate about them is, is the places where I felt like I'm so unqualified. I have no idea what I'm doing. I had a couple of men who decided they'd be advocates for me in the, in the midst of this process. When I wanted to give up or when I wanted to just say, forget it. You know, this isn't worth it. To have someone else be able to step in for you and say, let me handle this. Let me take care of this. Oh, that is just the best feeling. Have you ever had that happen to you in your life? Maybe it's in parenting where you're like, I'm going to throttle this child right now. And, and someone else comes in and says, go take a walk. I got this. Right? Those are the times in our lives when we need someone else to step in when we just can't, we're like, I can't represent myself right now. And as I'm reading in this passage that we're going to study this week in 1 John, he makes it so clear that in Jesus we have an advocate. An advocate that steps in when we can't represent ourselves. An advocate that, that steps into the place where we're so desperate for needing breakthrough in our lives. As we're studying in this sermon series about breaking through, we get to these places and we're like, I just can't. I just can't make it. I can't do it. I can't fix this. I can't seem to be better. We have an advocate, Jesus, who stands with us and says, no, breakthrough's coming. I'm with you. Breakthrough is coming because I'm with you. We just tell someone next to you, breakthrough's coming. <laughs> Last week, I talked about being in the light. We're in the book of First John, and we, we begin with chapter 2. Chapter 2, we looked at this classic contrast between good and evil, light and dark. And we were urged by the scripture to get anything and everything that's in the dark into the light. And we said if you've got things that you're secretly struggling with and keeping those in the dark, breaking through is not going to happen. I, 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 can, I can tell you with maybe, I can't ever say 100% certainty, but maybe 99% certainty that if you've got these things in your life and you've got things that are kept in the dark, break through, no, breaking through isn't going to happen for you. I, I, I can tell you from experience, walking in my own personal life and walking in the lives of many, many other people, I can tell you with a 99% certainty that breaking through is not going to happen when things are kept in the dark. And we looked at some self-delusions, self-delusions, and and, and maybe you took notes this week, if not last week, but uh, um, I'll, I'll just quickly recap. And if you don't have anything you take notes with, you can also download our church app, Abundant Life Ording, and there's notes right there on the front page of that app. Three self-delusions. The first self-delusion was saying, me and Jesus are good while continuing to walk in darkness. We walk in darkness and we go, oh, me and Jesus are good. If you're living in habitual sin, I said your fellowship with Jesus is affected. That your fellowship with him is going to be affected. He will feel distant. He will feel like he's not around. You feel like you can't hear from him. It will be impacted in your life. The second self-delusion we deal with is the one that says, you know, I don't sin anymore. I've arrived. I'm good. I've got this. And the truth is so often, I don't got this. This is why I need help. And then the third self-delusion we looked at was the one that says, I don't need saving. Because we've become so callous to sin or we've redefined sin in order to clear our conscience. These are self-delusions that keep us in the dark. And John says, I want you to live a life in the light. I want you to be fully in the light. Make every effort to get it into the light. And that life confesses, is forgiven, and is cleansed when we do sin. And we end with this verse in 1 John 1.10. That says, if we claim to have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So we get the point. Do you get the point John's trying to make? Okay, we sin. I get it. I don't need a reminder, but I get it. This is clearly the point he's trying to make. So then he continues on in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to read 1 and 2. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Okay, so he's just said, look, you sin. But I'm writing you this so that you won't. But 
If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We're going to just stop there. I, I had a bigger section of scripture I plan on talking about. We're just going to, we're going to stick with just two verses today. And I really appreciate the point of clarity he opens with. He follows off with all this talk about sinning and it being inevitable, saying, hey, I don't want you to forget something. The goal is to not sin. That's the goal. If you are a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, your goal is to not sin. Your goal isn't to say, hey, I'll do whatever I want because God's grace is upon me, so I'll just ask forgiveness tomorrow, right? That's not the goal. The goal is to not sin. Just because you will sin doesn't mean you should sin, okay? When you become a Christian, here's what happens. There's a change in your relationship with sin. I don't know if you noticed it. When you became a Christian, or maybe you were walking just kind of a mediocre walk with the Lord, and you're like, yeah, I, do the, I believe in God, but you really decided, I'm going to fully go all in with Jesus. What happens is there's a change in our relationship with sin. You see, a Christian no longer loves sin like he used to. It's no longer as enjoyable as it used to be. In fact, a Christian no longer brags about their sin as he used to. You ever met someone who brags about their sin? A Christian no longer plans to sin. As a Christian, you're not planning out to sin. You might have temptation and you might fail, but you're not planning to sin. A Christian no longer fondly remembers his sin as he once did. I mean, oh, those days, back in the days, you maybe used to talk about, oh, back when I was in college, I did this and this, and these are great stories, but now you hear those stories in your head, and you're like, those are stories I probably shouldn't tell because I'm not really proud of it. Before I was a Christian, I was proud of it, but I don't think I want to tell that story anymore because something changes within us. A Christian doesn't enjoy and in fact, when, when a Christian sins, there's usually a feeling of afterwards like, oh, I, know, I feel guilty about that. Because there's the, the conscience that the Holy Spirit has brought in us as we're transformed and made new. A Christian is no longer comfortable in habitual sin as he once was. Maybe before you came to Christ, you had habitual sin and you were just enjoying it. But now there's something in you saying, I know this isn't right. And maybe you're still stuck there and you're saying, but I, I, I can't stop, but I know I should. The relationship, the mentality towards sin shifts when you are made new in Christ. That's because your spirit, the Bible says, is reborn. That it, you, are, you are made new, that the old is gone, that the new has come, and your spirit has been made new. And so before, when your flesh was running this way, and your spirit was running with it, now your spirit's been made new and saying, we got to go this way, and it's got to drag your flesh behind because a lot of times the flesh wants to go the other way. I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this. He says this, Sin is dejected in the Christian's heart, though it is not ejected. Sin may enter the heart and fight for dominion, but it cannot sit upon the throne. See, there is a change in the relationship, and our lives as Christians should not be marked by sin. They should be marked by living like Jesus. That's what we're striving for. This is what John meant by walking in the light. That our lives are marked by being in the light. Our lives are marked by following Jesus. That, that sin is not an everyday occurrence. That sin is not, maybe not even an every week occurrence. That we are actually living our lives striving to be like Jesus. And sin is no longer the norm. But he says, if you stumble... If you do happen to stumble, well, what happens? Are you sentenced to hell all over again? No. Do you have to suffer great punishment from God? No. Well, does God put to plan? He gathers some angels around and says, hey, this one messed up. Let's, let's teach them a lesson. Let's, let's make them suffer through this because I want them to learn a really hard lesson because they messed up. No, God doesn't do that. That's not the character of God. He doesn't do any of those things. Why? Because when you sin, Jesus shows up. 
Jesus shows up, it says that he is the advocate. And I want to tell you what that looks like in your life with Jesus being the advocate. An advocate is someone who pleads the case of another before a judge. Jesus steps in on our behalf before the throne of God and he defends us. You ever needed someone to defend you? You ever been in a situation where someone's coming at you and whether it's just maybe verbally and you're like, looking at the person next to you, well, why didn't you defend me? You need someone to defend you. I want you to imagine what Jesus does. Imagine a courtroom scene. Pastor Kerry talked about that briefly. In a courtroom, you've got several players. You've got the judge, of course. You have the prosecuting attorney. You have a defense attorney. And then you have what? The person who's been charged with the crime. These are the major players in court. So who's who in this situation? Imagine this courtroom set up in heaven. And in this scenario, when you sin, you're on trial. You are on trial. That's what this looks like. In fact, uh, in, in, in this situation, the judge is God the Father. And so you sin. Now all of a sudden, there's a separation. You've failed. You've done something. You've maybe broken the law, whatever it happens to be. And the judge is there. And you have a prosecuting attorney that is accusing you. The prosecuting attorney is the devil. We read out of Revelation 12.10. It says this about Satan. It says, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night. Now in Revelation, that's the end of times. It says he's thrown down. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, he wants to accuse you. He wants to accuse you. He is the prosecuting attorney. And apparently, he doesn't take a day off. Isn't that annoying? It says day and night. He's accusing you. Did you see what Brad did? He messed up. You shouldn't let him into heaven. Did you see what Brad did? He messed up. You should, you should push him out. You should make him pay. But then there's the defense attorney. And that's Jesus. And he's there to advocate for you on your behalf. It says in Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Guess what? He never takes a day off either. He never takes a day off either. Aren't you glad that when you fail, you aren't sunk? Aren't you glad that you aren't hung out to dry? You're not destined to live a life of shame and condemnation. Jesus stands up for you. And I kind of imagined it like this, where there's this courtroom and, and Jesus says, judge, your honor, may I approach the bench? You ever seen that happen in a Maybe in real life, maybe in a TV show. May I approach the bench? And Jesus approaches the bench and he says, Judge, my client is guilty. In fact, he confessed to me. He actually confessed to me that he was guilty. But your honor, this one belongs to me. This one belongs to me. And I want to remind you, your honor, and I want to remind the prosecutor that a person in my possession cannot be punished for these charges. That is the agreement that was made. Because, your honor, it's already been paid in full. And because it's been paid in full, this person cannot be imprisoned. They cannot be assessed the penalty. And so, your honor, I request a pardon for my client. With that, Jesus says, I rest my case. And the judge rules in favor. The gavel comes down and he rules in favor of the defense and he commands the prosecutor, you must be silent on this matter because the case is closed. And he turns to you and he says, you are free to go. Case dismissed. And you have now experienced the full weight of the grace and mercy of God because you have an advocate in Jesus. This is what happened when you got saved. And it happened the last time you sinned and you confessed and were forgiven. Jesus stood up for you. Jesus stood up for you. Jesus stands up for you. But it gets even better than that. I'm like, I'm good. Jesus stand up, stands up for me. I'm happy. I don't know about you, but I'm happy. Jesus stood up for me. You can just like, call it a day. But he did more than stand up for you. Jesus stood in for you. He does more 
than just stand up for you. He stood in for you. He stands in for you. And he keeps on standing up and he keeps on standing in over and over and over and over. It tells us here in the scripture that he is the atoning sacrifice, this idea of atonement. And this idea of atonement goes all the way back to the Old Testament when they would offer the life of an animal on an altar as a sacrifice for sin, saying, God, we've messed up. Here's a sacrifice. Would you see the, that we've given up this life of this animal? And the Lord would say, I will accept that as a pleasing offering. Your life is spared. But Jesus took it another step and became an eternal sacrifice. This Greek word for atone used here is the Greek word halasmos, and it is defined as a sacrifice that bears God's wrath. I'd be fine if it stopped there. But it means that it bears God's wrath and then turns it into favor. So not only do you not experience the weight of your sin, you actually end up with favor. I don't know about you, but if you do something wrong, your kids, they lie and they hit their sister and they're, they're mean and they're terrible. And at what point do you say, hey, don't worry about it. It's okay. And let's go out for ice cream. No, no. They're, they're, they're grounded. They're going to the room. They're sitting on the timeout chair. They're doing what, whatever it is. They got lost their, their video game, whatever it is that you do. Like it's punishment. And yet when Jesus stands up for you before God, when you've confessed, when you've admitted, you said, I'm wrong. I need your forgiveness. And God says, oh, great. Let's go off for ice cream. That his wrath actually turns into favor. So not only are you not charged, but you're given favor because you have come to Jesus, who represents you before the throne of God. Listen, there are lots of spiritual movements. There are lots of religious movements. It is only through Jesus that we're saved. It is only through the name of Jesus. It is so critical for us as Christians to not keep this to ourselves, that we get out into our world. People need to know the name of Jesus because they're not going to get the favor of God by being a really nice person. They're not going to get the favor of God by bowing to Buddha. They're going to get the favor of God through Jesus and only Jesus. They're not going to get the favor of God by being enlightened, by doing enough meditation, by lighting enough incense. It's Jesus. He is before the Father. It says in 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. There's just one way. There is just one way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The world would like you to believe that he is a way, a truth, and a life. But the word of God tells us that he is the way. It is one way. It is one way. It's not enough. I believe as Christians that it is not enough for us to say, you know what? Now, hey, listen, we sh I will disclaimer this. We should love people, period, end of story. If they think differently than us, they, they, they have a different religion than us, we should love people. They'll know us by our love, okay? But here's the thing. It's not enough for us as Christians to go, look, they can have their religion, I'll have my religion, we just, it's, it's fine, it's what's the big deal? Like, they're gonna believe their thing, I'll believe my thing, it's not... A, we should have something within us that just weeps that says they need Jesus. We need Jesus. I don't mean to be intolerant, but what I mean is not be satisfied with just, oh, just leave them alone. They've got their thing and they're fine and they believe their thing and they're good people here. And they do. We should have something in us that says, man, I don't want to see them die without knowing Jesus because there is just one way and it is by Jesus. He does this for you. He says he does this for all. He does this for you. He mediates for you. He mediates for your friend. He mediates for your children. He mediates for your spouse. He'll mediate for your boss who's really not very nice right now, but if he confesses in Jesus, he'll do it for him too. It says for the whole world. He's done this. He's the advocate. He wants to advocate for you today. In places where you're struggling, he's ready to advocate for you. Where you need breakthrough, he's ready to advocate for you. 
Jesus is advocating for your breakthrough. I believe that with my whole heart that the places we need breakthrough in our lives aren't just the places. I don't say, God, I need breakthrough in my life because I need a 2023 name that car, right? That's not breakthrough, although I'll take it, right? right? When we need breakthrough in our lives, it's usually because there's something broken, it's because there's something that needs restored. It's there's something that's died. It's something that is hurting us. There's something that is, there's a, a sin in us that we can't seem to get past. There was a relationship that continues to stay a mess and we just can't get through it. There's a situation that isn't resolved because there is, there is dark involved. There is brokenness involved. And Jesus advocates for your breakthrough because he advocates for you to be made heal and whole and restored in living the life that he has for you. He wants the issue that is plaguing you in your life. He wants it gone. Don't say dumb stuff like, well, it's, you know, Paul's had a thorn in the flesh. I guess this is my thorn in the flesh. Don't say dumb stuff like that. He wants you set free. He wants you healed. He, that's what God's heart is for you. I don't know what Paul had going on. That was between him and the Lord. But Paul said he had that going on. It doesn't say in scripture, and by the way, each one of you are going to have that too. That was a struggle. And I, I feel for Paul. They had that struggle. But I got struggles. You got struggles. But I'm not content to sit back. Paul also said, look, I'm not perfect, but I'm never going to stop striving for it. I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to let down. I'm going to keep pressing toward the prize that Jesus has for me. Because he wants to see you well. He wants to see you restored. He wants to see your brokenness healed. Do you need an advocate? Anyone besides me in this room? I'm, I'm going to, both hands for me. Like, I need an advocate in my life. I need an advocate in Jesus. He wants to remove the stain of guilt. Some of you are like, you know, I've been following Jesus and, I, and I'm good and I know I'm forgiven, but I've still got some guilt. I've got guilt from something I did 20 years ago and it just won't, I cannot get past it. I made a decision. I know now it was wrong, but I have lived in shame my entire life over this thing. And Jesus is standing there as your advocate. And he's saying, enough. Enough, let me wash it. Let me take it. He wants to wipe clean that constant accusation in your mind. I remind you that Paul writes in Romans that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That the enemy can't keep condemning you when you are in the light, when you are in Christ. Now, if you're going to keep walking in darkness, he has the right to condemn you all day long because he's right. But you aren't done. It's not over. Jesus wants to step in for some of you this morning where you've got shame that is just coming at you and it's been coming at you for years. And he wants to he wants to stand between you and shame. Like if, if this is you and this is shame, Jesus, if I represented Jesus, say, right, let me just stand between you and shame. I want to stand between you. I want to be the advocate for you. The advocate is breaking through, I believe, this morning. And I want to, I want to just urge you, don't try to do this on your own. Don't try to fight with your own strength. Don't try to just defend yourself when accusation comes. I've been accused by the enemy. I've been accused by people. One of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was not defend myself when I was, things were being said that were not true. I called up my, my pastor at the time, my boss, and I said, I don't know what to do. And he said, let God defend you. Close your mouth and let God defend you. And I was like, I don't like that advice. <laughs> but it was the best thing I ever did. I let the advocate defend me when accusation came. I let the advocate bring breakthrough in your life. Will you stand this morning as we close?
we just close your eyes and, and just, we're going to just go before the Lord for a moment. I want you to just ask, I just want to ask you to ponder this question. Do you need an advocate today in your life? Whether it's an area of sin, in an area of brokenness, in an area of a situation that needs restoration, healing, whatever it is, do you need an advocate? Do you need Jesus to stand with you as you fight to break through? Do you need a defender who will push back the lies of accusation from the enemy that try to disqualify you? Oh, that's a big one. God can never use you. Look what you've done. Do you need to place the weight of your sin back on the one who died for you? Do you need an advocate? Do you need someone to stand with you in this thing that you're walking through right now? If you're in that place right now and you're saying, I, I, need, I need him to stand with me in this, just as every eye is closed, we just focus on the Lord. Could you just come up to the front? I just, I just want to see this. It's like heaven's courtroom represented where Jesus is standing and saying, I'm ready to stand with you. If you're in that place and you're saying, I've got something in my life I got places, I've got, I don't know about you, but I got no, I'm not perfect. I got all kinds of stuff that I need Jesus to stand in with me in my life. And he does. If you're in that place, just go ahead and come on forward, even right now. Just come stand. It's just as a representation, we're just going to say, Jesus, I'm coming up here. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to stand next to you, Jesus. I'm going to stand and be in your presence because I need an advocate today. I need an advocate. This situation, I'm tired of it being broken. I'm tired of it not working. I'm tired of these places in my life that need to, that, that I'm getting lied to about. These places where I'm being accused. This place where guilt won't go away. This place where I'm still stuck in this shame. This place where this sin, I, I've been fighting it. And Lord, I need your help. Jesus, I need you to stand in. Lord, we come before you today. Just come on forward, church. I need you today, Lord Jesus, to be my advocate. I need you to stand with me, Lord Jesus, that you would fight along with us. Lord, if we're going to see breakthrough in our lives, we need you, Jesus, to advocate for us. We praise your name, Jesus, that you were the atonement, that you were the one that took the weight and the penalty, that you took the shame, that you took the guilt upon yourself. And Lord, we put our lives in your hands. And we say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to stand with me. I need you to be my advocate today. Lord, would you come and would you minister to our hearts? Would you, as, you, as you're up here this morning, and if you still need to come up, come on forward. If you just want you to just spend time with the Lord and say, Jesus, what do you have to say about this? What do you have to say about this? If you want prayer from someone, we've got people up here that are willing to pray with you. We would love to pray with you, but if you just want to spend time with Jesus, I want you to just ask him, Jesus, what do you say about this? Jesus, show me how you're going to stand with me in this situation. Show me what to do next. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for your people, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, for breakthrough to come as you advocate on our behalf. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's worship together. As we close, just spend some time with the Lord. If you want to like to come forward, there's room.